So yeah, so my name is Mark Hintz. I, uh, I work at Interactive Things. We're a small uh, user experience design and data visualization studio based in Zurich. Um, and yeah, today I'm here to talk about React, the ideas behind the hype. So um, I looked at React before I'd ever heard of Interactive Things, before I moved to Switzerland, and uh, I didn't really see the point. Um, I kind of I looked through some of the documentation. I saw JSX, which I'll talk about later, and I got really turned off by that. That looked super ugly. And I never really went any deeper than that. Uh, and then since working at uh, Interactive Things, we use React in a lot of projects, and I've kind of changed my mind about it. And now I think it's actually pretty cool. So what I'm here to do today is to tell you kind of a broader story about how to simplify large front-end applications that have lots of interaction and state changes and stuff like that, and how React kind of enables you to do that sort of stuff. So onto the basics. Um, and pardon me for people who've seen React before, or used it before, some of this stuff is going to be like a top level overview of how the library does what it does. Um, so it's a framework that's gotten a lot of hype, uh, but the distinction between what React really does and the ways that people use it uh, is pretty large. Because React, at its core, is really just like a fancy templating library. It's good for rendering DOM. Um, it can be used at any level of the DOM. Uh, a lot you can output JS DOM objects or HTML strings so that you can render from the client but also on the server. Um, React is often used as a rendering engine that creates like the entire contents of an app from the top level all the way down, but you don't have to do that. You can embed it and use it in just one part of an app, or you can use it to render just like a tooltip or something. I've done that before. Um, it just requires a root object to render into and then the structure that you want to create. So uh, how React works is you create with React components an in-memory JavaScript representation of the DOM that you want. Uh, React then compares that to the DOM structure that you actually have, and it resolves the differences between the two by just applying the changes which are relevant. Um, the in-memory representation, this sort of hypothetical thing on the left, is uh, the virtual DOM that you've heard so much about. Um, because React just applies the changes, the differences between the two, it can be pretty fast. And it doesn't have to recreate the entire DOM structure every time you do a render. Um, it also can schedule these changes slightly asynchronously. So it uses request animation frame under the hood to update the DOM while the browser is getting ready to do a repaint. So that can, uh, you can optimize performance a little bit that way. Um, when you render a React uh, structure, you build a sort of tree. You start with the instance of the base component, uh, and that component is basically just a function which returns its children. Some of those children are themselves DOM objects or representations of DOM objects, uh, but some are other React components. Those other React components are then asked to render their contents, uh, and eventually you trickle all the way down the tree and you get all DOM. Um, the way that React components specify what children they want to have is this weird uh, templating language that Facebook came up with called JSX. I think it's kind of a bad name because it doesn't have a lot to do with JS and it looks a lot more like HTML. Um, and JSX is really weird. It's, uh, you need a compilation step before you can actually run it. The syntax is super strange. Um, it looks like you just copy and pasted your template into your JavaScript and that's super ugly. Uh, but it can be OK. Um, the compilation step that you need to go through in order to use it can all be handled by build tools. Uh, the JSX is just transformed into an underlying JavaScript API that's sort of calling React functions. And the nice thing about having this other representation is that the API can change, but you don't have to change JSX. So this gives the developers of React a lot of flexibility in how they actually implement the sort of component structure. Uh, and this has actually already happened at least once in React's development. They changed the underlying API, um, but they didn't have to do anything about JSX. Um, another thing that is often objected to with JSX is that it violates uh, separation of concerns. Uh, but the thing is that React applications tend to separate their concerns along different lines than the normal consideration. So a React components, really their only concern is the DOM output. That's like all it's there to do is create this virtual DOM. Uh, because really, React is just a template renderer. You know, it's pretty dumb. It just creates these, these, uh, these virtual trees. The hard stuff all happens somewhere else in the app, which I'll get to later. But it is still pretty ugly, so you kind of have to swallow that. 
um, because you used to be able to just use the underlying API, but Facebook's really pushing on you to use JSX and then be able to compile that. So uh, when you're specifying a component, um, I'll talk a little bit about how it renders its content. Components receive properties when they're rendered, uh, and they pass properties on to their children. Um, the component itself is like a function, and each of the children that it creates is also like a function. Uh, and those functions return a virtual DOM object. Once all the functions have been called, you have this tree. So the properties that you pass in are really just arguments to that function. Uh, and React encourages you to write components so that they only rely on those arguments. They don't draw information from any other part of the application. They don't check any other application state. And they don't know anything about where or why they're being rendered to do what they do. So um, that's really kind of it when it comes to React. Uh, you build this tree. The tree gets then turned into real DOM. Um, and a lot of the interesting stuff, all the complicated business of handling application state, that happens somewhere else. All the complicated business of figuring out which parts of the UI to update and which parts you leave the same, that's all handled by the framework. Um, React just applies the difference between what you want and what you have to give you what you, ha what you want, basically. Uh, and so you can, as a consequence of this, you can write all of your display code for showing stuff on the screen as if you were redrawing the whole DOM from scratch every time you make any little change. Um, and React is able to implement those changes in an efficient way. So you never have to use jQuery to go into a specific part of the DOM and change one specific thing in response to one weird action. You don't have to do that. Um, this really simplifies the way that you can think about your whole UI. You just build this big tree that reflects the data and the state of the application at a given point in time, and then React draws that whole tree for you. So if you have one takeaway from this talk, it's that if you can take as much as possible out of your components any awareness of the application's broader state, what caused them to look the way that they look, um, what conditions were in place before they were rendered, things get a lot simpler. If you can really sort of streamline what the component does and just make it about creating, uh, creating view, creating DOM, then you handle the rest of the state in another part of the app and you simplify your view layer immensely. So um, now we get on to some of the really cool stuff about React. Um, when you render the tree, some elements get inserted into the DOM, some elements are removed from the DOM, and some are just updated. And you can write your components so that if none of the properties, none of the arguments have changed, that you know that none of the output is going to change. And because of that, you can check to see if the properties are different, and then if they aren't, just skip the whole update. And this is a really nice optimization. So sometimes you have a big component that has a lot of complex structure, but it's actually based on a few um, relatively straightforward arguments. And when those don't change, you don't have to redo the whole structure. So this is a great room for optimization. Another thing that you can do with React is um, to create what I call like dumb components. So instances of these React uh, front-end components tend not to manage any of their own state. Um, when they're asked to re-render, they don't do any interpretation of why they need to re-render or change their behavior based on certain things. They don't have to know what change in the state or what event from outside caused them to need to re-render. They don't have to go in and subscribe to all these different custom events or have access to any sort of global application state. Um, you know, you don't need to like have a bunch of you know a special event bus and then listen to all these different events and have different behavior, uh, and that's really cool because storing all that state information about the app in a lot of different places and all your different components, having lots of different behavior that can happen based on um, what kinds of preconditions are in place, those are real sources of complexity in an application. And when you have bugs or weird behavior in those apps, it can be very difficult to debug because of all that complexity. So React components are really like dumb. Um, and being dumb makes them very simple to write. They're simple to think about and simple to change and maintain. You know, at the end of the day, they're just these functions. They take arguments. They produce output. They produce like a visual representation of those, out those arguments. So um, you're probably now thinking, so like, where does all of the application state in a React app come from? Um, how do you know when you want to show a tooltip, when you want to hide the tooltip? Um, how do you know when a request from the server has returned, stuff like that? Well, so the answer is that um, after the application begins, and it's in this kind of fresh state, you can then think of any change that happens after that as a distinct thing. 
Um, this is kind of like the command pattern, which is used in some like big Java apps and stuff. You kind of you kind of encapsulate any type of change or any update to the application in like an object, and you actually have these little uh, event objects. React calls them actions, uh, and you pass those around. Actually, React doesn't call them actions, but that's the punchline of the talk. Um, uh, where was I? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So after the app starts, each change is this little thing, and you can. Um, you can generate these changes by the user, like when they click on a button, or the network can generate something when a GET request returns. Uh, there's lots of different sources of these events, but in the end, all the changes that happen to the state get encapsulated in this little package, which get passed around. Um, and when a change is actually made, you then calculate the new state of the app based on the current state with the plus the change. And the view side just re-renders everything all at once, or at least you can think of it as if it was doing that, even though it's not actually doing that. Um, and so you can do this kind of process even in response to a really small change in the state, something like incrementing a counter or a small click somewhere. Um, and React's rendering really handles all the rest. So once you have this going, you can think of any state at any given time as the result of the previous state plus whatever the most recent minor change was. And you can follow that chain of causation all the way back to the initial state of the app when it was fresh and there was nothing. And so the current application state is just a result of sort of repeatedly applying these changes over time. Um, and you can also store this history of little changes, uh, and you can analyze those later. You can log those to a server if you want to monitor what the customer is doing. You can um, store them and then replay them in case somebody reports a bug in the way that the app looks. Um, and by each time sort of going from one totally encompassed state, adding a change, going to the next totally encompassed state, you can construct this really nice chain of states that gives you sort of a history. Um, really advanced implementations, you can sort of save those states and you can do undo and redo on that stuff. Um, but that's all kind of, that's all sort of growing out of this way of treating each change as like a, as like a unitary uh, uh, effect on the state. Uh, uh -oh. Did I switch windows? Come on. There we go. Oh, now I'm back to the top here. Right, right. So, um, condensing all the behaviors that could uh, happen in your app into a single stream of events, and each of those events mutates the state in a small way. And that really simplifies thinking about how you manage all the different possible states in your app, all the different ways that your app can behave and the different things that could happen in it. And when you're debugging, you can just look at that history of changes, and that simplifies figuring out exactly what happened to the state to get it into this weird configuration that it's in now. And you can look at the functions which manipulate that state and make sure that they're doing the correct behavior to verify that your app is doing what you want it to do. Um, and this kind of condensing everything into a single stream of events and channeling it all through a state object and then rendering in a very dumb way, the big secret is that's Flux. Uh, that's this, this approach that React enables. Uh, it's also this name for a kind of architectural idea that people are encouraged to use when they're using React. Um, and it's a, it's, a, it's a pretty simple argument, despite the way that uh, it often gets presented as sort of this big, like, complex concept. But it's pretty straightforward. You just have this dumb state, these dumb events, and these dumb UIs. And then everything gets a lot simpler. Um, and the other thing that's really cool about, uh, about React is that that's like a very functional way of approaching this kind of problem. So uh, before I got into uh, working with React and working with Flux, I didn't really know that much about like functional programming or about the functional style. I, uh, I thought it was kind of like this fancy way for math-minded people, and I'm not really a math-minded person, to make all of their sort of server-side calculations very elegant, but I didn't understand how like if you have a big app with a lot of different things that are going on at the same time and you need to store this information about what the user is doing all over the place, um, how that would work if you only had functions. Like you need some object to put that stuff in. But the way that uh, functional programming approaches this, this problem is by having this kind of, rather than having lots of individual objects, each with their own individual state that has to be updated and kept in sync all the time, you have sort of a large state data structure. And then you have a, a UI which renders that state. 
And then all the changes just sort of update to a new data structure, and then the UI sort of responds in kind. Um, and React is a really clever optimization of front-end rendering, which enables you to do that kind of programming. And that's really sort of the core, those are the sort of hidden ideas behind the, the hype of React that make it a pretty cool introduction to a more sort of functional style. So that's kind of everything. That's, uh, that's, that's most of what I wanted to cover. Um, the cool thing about React is that you can use these ideas about handling state and packaging events in a small package in an app that doesn't use React at all. Uh, you can use it in an Angular app or in any kind of structure. Um, and you can use React rendering just for like the templating and the sort of fast front-end rendering in an app which doesn't use the Flux concepts at all. They're, they're pretty much disconnected. Uh, but those ideas are out there if you want to explore them and if you want to get an introduction to them. Um, it's, a, it's a really nice way of, of going in there. So that's pretty much everything. Um, we have a, quite a bit of time for questions. Um, and if you want to see any more of our work or get in touch, go to interactivethings.com and tweet me with comments and stuff. Um, and yeah, I mean, I think, mm, I don't know how fast I went through that whole thing, but uh, <laughs> I think I blew through. So. Please ask uh, any questions that you might have about React or how applications are structured with it or something like that. First, a, w first a warm applause, obviously. <laughs> yes, sir. Cool. Thank you for your talk. Mm -hmm. So, okay, you convinced me. I will use React for my next pet project. Now, it's very cool. Um, what's a good resource to, to learn React? I saw that there's some documentation, maybe not that much, mm. some videos. And also, is, th is there a, a nice open source, uh, of course, open source, and a nice project that uses React that I can use like to read and see how, how, how to build things nicely? Mm. Um, so, yeah, so Facebook maintains documentation about React. Um, which is, is okay, it explains the API, uh, but it doesn't go much into the sort of concepts of like how to use it. Um, I think there are a few tutorials out there. Frankly, I learned a lot of it from my coworkers who had already been using it before, so that that's, I kind of cheated that way or something. Um, there's also documentation for Flux, this architectural pattern, um, which focuses a lot on the use of a single event emitter and channeling all of your events through that thing uh, and sort of talks about this stream of events approach. The more functional stuff is stuff that people are starting to build on top of React. There's a framework written in Clojure Script called Ohm that's like, kind of was one of the first to approach it in this way. Uh, and then since then, there have been several other very sort of functional oriented frameworks that use React as a rendering component. Um, as far as projects, I mean, there's like a to do MVC for example, you know, there's. <laughs> Um, there are a few libraries out there which try to sort of implement components which embody the Flux patterns. Um, and so there's something called Redux, which is relatively recent, which is a very good library for um, if you want kind of like an architecture library in addition to React rendering. Um, something called Flummox, but that may not be in development anymore. So. And then there's plenty of talks like this one that are out there where people <laughs> talk about that kind of thing. All right, thank you. Hi, uh, business question. Mm -hmm. How you would pitch uh, React instead of Angular towards large business client? Because, you know, Angular mm -hmm. has this time of being approved by C++ guys and Java <laughs> guys. And yeah. Um, yeah, I don't know. I mean, if they've heard of Angular and they've decided, yeah, I want an Angular app, then it, you kind of have to say something along the lines of, well, you know, there's a lot of different ways to, to slice this apple, and Angular is one way of achieving this, but it's not the only way of doing a front-end application. Um, they may still have their heart set on it because they've heard of it, uh, and then you might be stuck. Um, what we tend to do is we tend to work with clients that don't have such strong opinions about it, and so they're okay with us using the technology stack that we know the best and that we prefer. Um, it's also, React, is, React as a library is really just this um, very sort of interesting virtual DOM implementation, this front-end library thing. Um, and so you could conceivably use React to render 
the templates and render the content within the context of an Angular app or an app that uses Angular's dependency injection structure, that uses Angular components to decide when to update, and that uses the various like network communication libraries that make Angular pretty helpful, and it uses like the router and stuff. So you could maybe say, oh yeah, we're using, I mean, it might be a little bit of overhead to include two big frameworks in your, in your uh, downloaded script. That might be a little crazy, but uh, yeah. I have to confess, I also don't speak very much to the clients. I'm more like the developer guy, so Isn't, maybe, yeah. Wouldn't, wouldn't be like, I mean, as far as I know, on, on the Angular site, doing that whole isomorphic application kind of mm. thing is, is not really possible. Mm. So maybe that would be one argument. I mean, I have never tried it, but I think it's, po have, you, have you done that? Like having server site rendered, uh, websites that mm. in a way that you can without JavaScript like not breaking the web right no and that's something that's really cool about react is you can require your components in uh, on the server side and then you know load up with data or load up a certain state for a user and render the whole the whole tree but to uh, an, a string uh, to like a template and then you can return that as uh, the the response from from an HTTP request um, there's nothing in React that forces you to use it on the client side. It works just fine on the server in Node. So you and then you and can you can hook up right once it gets delivered to the client. You can hook up your React to. to yeah, the exactly. You can like so React has sort of an internal bookkeeping uh, system for this sort of React ID system for keeping track of what elements belong to what components. You don't need to worry about it, but. Uh, when you render on the clients, uh, sorry, on the server side, it will inject those IDs into the templates, and then when you initialize React on the client side, it'll kind of already know what everything should belong to, and you can just jump right into doing these uh, sort of incremental change updates very quickly. Okay. Yes. Um, from what I understand, Angular 2 will also support. Need the microphone. Closer, okay. From what I understand, Angular 2 will also uh, support isomorphic or universal JavaScript. Mm -hmm. um, but my question was actually with, uh, with React. Um, one great thing about Angular is that you get a whole application framework mm. and you kind of get a good guidance on how to actually create an application. Mm. And uh, React is a, a little bit limited. It's a little bit uh, more just the user interface side of things. Therefore, we have Flux. Mm. And there seems to be at a th about a thousand different flux, flux implementations. Mm. For somebody that's new to React, how does one decide <laughs> which flux implementation to go for? What, can you recommend some, maybe that are based on RxJS or something else? I mean, yeah. Yeah, it's funny because we um, we used the Facebook flux implementation for the first couple of projects, and then switched to something called Flummox, which uh, was in development for a while. And then I think the Flummox developer decided that he didn't want to work on Flummox anymore and said everybody should use Redux. So now we use Redux. Uh, and it's true, there, is, there are a lot of these different implementations of, uh, these, of these patterns. I would recommend Redux at the moment. Um, it's by somebody who knows a lot about React and does, uh, it is heavily involved in like some of the, the tooling, creation of tooling for React, a guy named Dmitry Baranovsky, I think. Um, and that's R-E-D-U-X. But more broadly, the thing about uh, the Flux architecture is it's kind of a system for managing your state and managing the events that change the state. So you have listeners in, uh, which are attached to the components to listen to things like clicks or select or something like that. And those listeners just generate these little event objects. The event objects go off and they go into this kind of like chain of events. Um, the, somewhere else there is a component which is processing all of those and then feeds them into the state. The state recomputes what it should be and then says, okay, update everything. And the UI just responds very dumbly. Um, and so that basic pattern is relatively simple to implement on your own. You can do it with um, an event emitter and an object which 
has sort of a state object which stores data in fields and then has an update function which just checks to see what kind of change it was, updates itself, and then emits an update event. And then the, the UI just listens to a single event, the sort of update. And in response to that, it redoes everything. You pass all of the state values down to the components that need them in that structure, and then everything just kind of works together. So I would suggest if you're looking for an, an architectural implementation up front to use Redux, but um, you could also just try doing it yourself. <laughs> Thanks. Uh, another question, perhaps. OK. So uh, thank you very much. Yeah. Two, two of the most exciting uh, technologies we talked about right now. Uh, you ah. will get one of these. Oh, so please, please hack around with it and maybe give a talk next year about Esprino. Um, up next, we will have uh, a talk that needs some setting up, so we will maybe take a five-minute break. Thank you very much. Thanks very much, guys. Appreciate it. <laughs>